approved as set forth, and that each item is considered ready for discussion and or action. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Director Mershbrock. Aye. Director Newman. Aye. Director Garlock. Aye. Director Tominski. Aye. Director Riesinger. Aye. Director Borchardine. Aye. President Humbles. Aye. Moving Aye. on to the superintendent's report, uh, Superintendent Bush, I will turn the meeting over to you. Thank you very much. And I think that I need the ability to share my screen. There we go. I have the ability to share. Okay, hang on one second here. That's not going. There we go. All right. Well, it's been two short weeks since we last met and um, uh, the work always continues, but we definitely have some moments of celebration and information for you tonight. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say congratulations um, to some uh, ad ad current administration and future administration. Uh, congratulations to Annie Bradford, who has been named the future Johnson STEAM Academy uh, principal pending board approval starting July 1st. And so uh, Annie actually had some time in Cedar Rapids Community School District uh, years prior in both facilitator roles as well as teaching roles. And she's currently elementary principal up in the Starmont School District. So we welcome Annie back home to Cedar Rapids and to the JSA community. Also, congratulations to our Executive Director of Digital Literacy, Mr. Craig Barnum, who has been announced as the School Administrators of Iowa Central Office Administrator of the Year, a very esteemed award. And Craig has uh, been recognized by his peers for especially the heavy lifts he's been doing in regards to um, digital literacy efforts and equity and access in our district. Congratulations to Craig and uh, certainly to all of our team members who have supported our technology and digital literacy efforts. Last week was Earth, uh, Earth Day uh, within our week last week. And this is a picture of some of our Cedar River Academy at Taylor Elementary students who worked on some bird feeder projects in collaboration with some Iowa big high school students. And we had many projects like this happening throughout our district to celebrate Earth Day, uh, which is of course recognition um, of how important it um, our efforts around our green teamwork is, sustainability efforts, and certainly that has been pronounced as, a, as an area of importance for our school board, but always great to see our kids doing uh, fun and innovative ways to celebrate um, our earth. And certainly that's a theme at Taylor Academy as our sustainability school. And lastly, uh, last week was, boy, um, a lot, a lot of work to implement uh, the ISASP um, tests, which are state assessments. As you can see in the picture in front of you, um, we have shifted from our former booklets and pencils that went to every student in our environments to a digital format to take those assessments. And that, of course, included within the context of our return to learn plan and our safety efforts, our remote students who have been learning from a distance this year, we had to have them come in person. And so we had to put extra uh, precautions in place and keep everyone safe and a lot of navigations. I was visiting a couple of our schools on Friday and were, um, they were definitely feeling as though um, there was a lot of success through the operations, but we also know there's still some students who need to make up the tests that were not able to take them this week or this past week. And so um, just um, how important these assessments are, they are, they're a one-time metric for student measurement, but they're also a metric that we look at for our progress as a school district and on our strategic plan, um, certainly our goals um, are in alignment with the state assessments, as well as the formative assessments that were reviewed at the last board meeting. But my last um, shout out to this is, is to our students 
who have had to do this in a whole new way this year and came with such positive attitudes and rolling up the sleeves and getting in and, and doing their jobs and our staff who supported that to happen and our families to make sure that kids were ready and emphasizing how important this is to our district. So thanks to everyone for all of your work around Iowa assessments. That was a, a new way of doing it. Another new thing for us this year, but very proud of all the efforts there. So that's all I have for you this evening. And unless there are any questions for me, I'll hand it back over to you, President Humbles. Muted. Hey, President Humbles, I believe your mic is muted there, ma'am. You're right. I apologize for that. I, uh, <laughs> thank you for the update, Superintendent Bush. Um, do we have any board reports? Uh, President Humbles, I have just have a really brief legislative report. Um, the legislative session is actually winding down. This week is the last week uh, of scheduled session. Um, the per diem for the legislators runs out at the end of this week, so they'll be wrapping things up soon. Um, there's not a lot happening in terms of the bills we've been watching because right now they're working on budget uh, considerations and things in the Ways and Means Committee. Um, we're still we're still watching the charter school bill. Um, it's it's still technically there, and they could do something with it um, yet before the end of the session. Uh, the voucher bill, which we are fairly certain is dead. Um, again, there are ways to add both of these to an amendment to a budget bill and still get them through here at the last minute. So while we're less concerned than we were earlier, um, we're, we're never sure until the final gavel falls. So we're still keeping an eye open. And that, that's really all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board reports? Okay, we'll move on to communications, delegations, and petitions. Uh, Board Secretary Day, do we have anyone who has pre-registered to address the board this evening? President Humble, board members, we have no one who has pre-registered for this evening's board meeting. Thank you. Seeing none, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Are there any items that the board member board members would like to pull for comment, question, or a separate vote? Okay, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? I second. Do, is there any further discussion at all? This is a roll call vote. Director Riesinger. Aye. Director Borcherding. Aye. Director Tominski. Aye. Director Garlock. Aye. Director Newman. Aye. Director Mershbrock. Aye. President Humbles. Aye. Next, we'll move on to administration, and I'm going to change the order of uh, these, uh, the information. So I'd like to start with BA 21302. Um, this is, it's an information item only regarding the, the sale of the school, um, excuse me, regarding the report of the sale of the school infrastructure sales services and use tax revenue bonds in series 2021A. Are there any questions for Dave at all? Okay, then next we will, is the resolution to authorize to provide issuance and secure the payment of the infrastructure, sales, service, and use tax revenue 
Bond Series 2020-2021A and authorize the execution and delivery of the documents. Uh, so we are at BA21300. I'm sorry, I didn't let you know that. Uh, do we have a motion for the resolution? So or do we have, well, let me, let me move back first, excuse me. Uh, do we have any questions for Dave? Okay, now do we have a motion for the resolution? Uh, again, uh, so moved. <laughs> Is there a second? A second. Do we have any further discussion at all? This is a roll call vote. Director Borchardine. Aye. Director Tominski. Aye. Director Newman. Aye. Director Mershbach. Aye. Director Garlock. Aye. Director Riesinger. Aye. President Humbles. Aye. Uh, next, the board is asked to approve the publication of the fiscal year 2020-21 budget amendment and scheduling of a public hearing, hearing at our May 10th meeting. And this is BA21301. Are there any questions at all for Dave? Dave, do you have uh, any comments at all? The only, these are uh, a very, uh, the budget amendment is actually just amending our current budget for the end of this fiscal year in four categories where we're required to meet. Uh, we cannot exceed any of these four categories that are attached. And so you can see majority of the uh, 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 reasons for some of the amendment is some of it has to do with the ESSER CARES Act money that we're going to be spending for some of the summer programming and and some of that, uh, some of the uh, HVAC upgrades that we're looking at, having discussions about doing. And so that's um, one of the main reasons for these adjustments. Okay. Thank you. So we need a vote on this. All those in fa favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank you. Uh, next, we will be moving into our work session. And this is, uh, it's more about to provide our feedback. Let me move back here. I'm sorry. I'm having problems with my eyes tonight, so I apologize for that. The final item on our agenda this evening is a work session to learn more about and provide our feedback for the 2021-2022 school year learning options. I will turn the meeting over to Deputy Superintendent Quaker at this time, and she will introduce her staff, and they will, will share their presentation with us. Thank you, President Humbles and Board of Directors. So tonight we have a team, a, a small team of us here presenting. So Ernie Cox, principal at Madison and who will be the new principal at CRVA for next year in a shared role, will be talking as well as Craig Barnum. There's been um, 16 people on the design team. So we'll go into some of that, but really excited to share an update for next year with you. So can everybody see the screen? If you can give me a thumbs up. Thank you much. It's loading a little slowly, but it will come hopefully. There we go. So next year we have two options for students and that is our virtual academy, which is gonna look different than it has this past year. In addition to of course, in-person learning, which will go back to that traditional in-person model and we'll have activities back available and so forth. I know people are asking, is there gonna be masks and all of those details, but that will be in the future that we'll learn more of that information. So do not have that yet. Do not know what will happen with COVID and the pandemic. 
So you can see on here the traditional in-person and you can also see the Cedar Rapids Virtual Academy for all students in K through 12. Also, I think an important point of this is activities and sports will be aligned to resident schools. So if you're a Washington student and you're in CRVA, you will still be able to take part in those sports and activities through Washington High School. And here it is, Ernie Cox, congratulations to him. We've been excited. He's been with us since we started on February 12th with the design team work of this and putting this together and operationalizing it. We met actually this afternoon as a planning team for a couple hours as well, just looking over what we have for students that have registered. So we did put out a survey to all remote students that are currently in remote learning for middle school and for elementary. And then also all the CRVA ones that are middle school. And then for high school, because of that hybrid model we've been using, we sent that to all families asking them to respond. So we did get some numbers and responses that we're working on and making our plan for what staffing will look like for next year. And Ernie will be a part of, of course, filling those spots and hiring and overseeing that programming while he leads Madison Elementary. Here is the summary of some of the work that we've done. So again, the key pieces, we've met as a design team multiple times, as you can see, February 12th, the 26th, March 10th. And really we've been solidifying that high leverage principles of what really we want to happen in the CRVA. We didn't have a whole lot of time last year to put this all together, but this year there's been time to learn from the opportunities that happened this year and really to put those design principles in place it was then really exciting that we opened it up to feedback. So we had all of the people on the design team recommend teachers that would be good to put in place to get their feedback from. So on March 30th, we had about 50 educators from the system who had been doing that remote instruction. Some of them, the ingenuity piece that they've been overseeing and they've been kind of tracking that work and others that have been actually doing that Cedar Rapids curriculum and instruction and ask them for feedback on where we were at and what those design principles looked like. So great feedback from them. Um, and they're also going to be helping in providing additional feedback. And then of course, moving forward, we were planning on using them to create the design of what each of those operationalized plans would look like, but decided be, be, be best to get the teachers in place. And those teachers for elementary really work on and operationalizing the details of the elementary based on the design principles same for middle school, same for high school. So we're going to be posting jobs next week and hopefully finalizing who those teachers are going to be in the next couple of weeks and then providing with them with some professional development and learning opportunities this summer to help with that work. And then as you can see here, we had that interest survey that went out that we got data from and we were clear on the metrics on that piece that we were making sure that we were getting the feedback. And if they didn't provide feedback, we were assuming that they were gonna be in person for the following year. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, a lot of questions about what does year one transitioning to year two CRVA looks like. So this slide provides you with um, some changes that are happening. So this year we had three options, in-person, remote, and CRVA. CRVA was a long-term option for 612 families. Next year, it's gonna be a long-term option for K-12. So we did get accreditation uh, through the Iowa DOE um, for uh, K-5. Um, the primary source in CRVA was Edgenuity. Now it will be CRCSD developed units will be the primary source of curriculum. If a student was enrolled in CRVA this year, um, it was all asynchronous, which would mean it's on demand. Students choose their time uh, when they want to log in and when they do their work. Next year, we'll really be focusing on what we would call synchronous, or that's that live teaching for courses K-8. Um, home building activity participation will continue the same. Um, this year, one of the major changes is we will have a principal to oversee the work and the programming for the K-12 option as well as um, our teachers will be teaching it live. So it'll be more look a lot like the remote option we had this year. Um, and we'll have schedules and times for students. Um, and we are gonna have a full day for elementary, middle and high uh, for CRVA students. So specifically, what does elementary look like? 
um, we don't have the master scheduled by minutes because we do want uh, the teachers to look at that and get into our specials. But here are the core curriculum um, norms that we will provide our students. Um, and what you'll notice here is uh, through our accreditation process uh, for K-5, we had to show that we're meeting chapter 12 requirements. So you'll notice that uh, families will have, a, or students will have a full 45 minutes of social and emotional curriculum. They'll have whole group reading and small group reading. So we can differentiate and personalize for the students as well as for math. Um, they will have live specials. That is something that's different from this year in the remote option. The remote option were videos this year and Eastern Iowa Car uh, Arts Academy supplemented that work. We are uh, dedicating specials to that. They'll have social studies and science and then we'll also have our what we would call our intervention or extension um, time for students built into the day so that they can re uh, receive their title services or if they are packed uh, students, they can receive those services as well. So that's what the elementary option will look like for our uh, Cedar Rapids families. And then before Craig starts, I'm going to apologize, Ryan. Sorry, I completely looked at my old notes, but Ryan Reedstrom, just for the board of directors to know, has been monumental in helping us this year with the remote learning and also in creating what CRVA is going to look like next year and is the brains behind all of this creativeness that you see in front of you. He's just been doing a fabulous job with the rest of the team. So wanted to make sure you know he's been overseeing elementary. He actually started middle school and elementary this year. Now Justin Blitz has joined in and assisted us with that and they've both done a fabulous job. So thank you to both of them. And Craig, sorry, I jumped in there. It's all good. I would even add a little bit more on Ryan. It's just that he was the architect of our of our K-12 resubmitted plan for uh, accreditation. So um, he does he does deserve a lot of a lot of credit there. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the middle school and high school schedules uh, and set up. It, it's a little different. We offer uh, our older kids a little more options and flexibilities, and, and you're going to see that over the next couple of slides here. The thinking being that as, as children age, they you know will hopefully need less and less scaffolding and can be a little more uh, self-directed. So at the middle school level, we really offered uh, three main options, and it's really mainly one that we're really focused on, which is that first one, option one, uh, where students are going to attend tasks taught online by CRCSD um, teachers. Just like Ryan said earlier, they'll all be uh, designed uh, units that uh, study from the CRCSD curriculum. Uh, but we don't want to rule out the fact that there may be a, a child at, at the middle school level who may need some uh, specific course, course offerings from Edgenuity, you know, maybe along the high school level, something along those lines. Uh, and then because we did offer it this year, we felt compelled to at least make the offering to, to make it possible for that uh, Edgenuity only option for middle school, though, frankly, we, we don't recommend that. We think that uh, uh, and having taught middle school for a number of years, I, I you know, I, I feel like the, the kids at that age will probably need a little more structured and scaffolding. We've got two schedules up for middle school. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, it should look very familiar if, you're, if you've ever uh, walked through one of our middle schools. Um, it's going to feel a lot the same in terms of, of, of what the kids experience. Uh, we've put a, a, a Monday through Thursday schedule and a Friday schedule up there. Uh, I, the only thing I really draw attention to is the, the way we, we capstone each day. Uh, we start the day with a, large, with a live advisory time just to make sure we're checking in with all of our kids and that uh, the intent here is that that our, that our kids are making progress and this is a, a way for us to provide uh, some extra supports and to stay in touch with the kids. And then at the end of, of, of the Monday, Thursday schedule, there would be some time there for teacher office hours and, you know, again, some uh, structured supports for kids who may need it. Moving on to high school, there's a little less definition here because it's a little more complex. And I know that sounds funny, but it's, it's actually the way it works. Um, with all of the various uh, options that, that kids have at high school, um, thinking that we we're going to just staff uh, a, a separate CRVA building um, was a little daunting and probably uh, not feasible for year one. So we looked at it for like, again with three options and they're, and they're largely the same, although they'll be operationalized a little differently. Uh, the first option again would be the option um, where kids would take uh, courses taught by all of uh, CRCSD teachers, sort of live but remotely. Um, the option, the second option would be a mix of, of edgenuity, um, a course that maybe we have someone who uh, doesn't have, we don't have enough interest to offer a full section of, uh, 
online learning for, but there's something in the Edgenuity Bank that works, or maybe the kids want to do a mix of all three. And so this is a little different option uh, along those lines. Um, and I kind of laid that out as option three, and I apologize, I mixed them together, but that's, that's largely the scope of it. The thinking at high school is at this point uh, is that we'll we'll structure a, a, a CRVA building inside uh, uh, our student management system, but that largely, um, again, it'll be staffed with teachers taking a section here or there of uh, teaching, so we can get over overcome some of the uh, uh, certification and uh, other logistical problems that come with staffing a high school, basically a brand new high school. So we're excited about the opportunities and we're ready to move on. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. I think it's Ernie next, right? Thanks, Craig. Um, you can see how this team's already taking care of me. They only gave me one slide tonight because, you know, I'm still running schools and things. Um, this team's man fantastic. And I would just echo again, Ryan, um, thank you for all the work you've done this year. It really has provided the momentum um, for us to move forward on this timeline that I'd like to walk you through. <clears throat> I actually would like to take a minute and go way back on my timeline. 16 years ago, my first education job in um, a K-8 school in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, we got in touch with a little company that thought they wanted to try some applications online for the education environment. And we ended up piloting a little something called Google Apps for Education. Um, and we began rolling out one-to-one -one, uh, computing for our middle school and we thought we could maybe increase cooperative learning in the school and, and maybe make homework a little more meaningful. Um, I think we did those. And now we fast forward to now, look at what we have accomplished this year um, and look how much people want to continue this. Uh, we have massive community interest in continuing this model. Um, and I am just, I am really exhilarated to go along the points coming up in front of you. We are finalizing numbers uh, this week, um, and we have had a good response from uh, families that have used this option um, this past year. Um, we will be able to post some full-time positions in uh, next week is what we're aiming for. Um, we'll review and be able to select some of those full-time CRVA teachers by um, mid-May. And then a passion of mine in June, we will get to meet um, with those teachers and begin to plan the work that we want to do to grow um, what we have done this year going into next year. So we'll have some professional learning time with those CRVA teachers. Uh, July will be an amazing opportunity to actually begin to engage with families that have picked this option and begin to, know, begin to get to know why and uh, how we can best serve them. Because we, we know there are a variety of reasons families are coming to this option in the coming year. And we want to do our best to serve that variety of op options in this academy. And then August, um, hopefully August, yes, we'll get to start in August. Um, we will launch the K-12 CRVA for its first year as a K-12 program. And it will be our first year. So we know we'll continue to learn and uh, grow this option um, as we go forward. And I believe I'm turning it over to Superintendent Bush. Thank you, uh, team. And uh, you know, this is one of those moments, um, board members, that uh, I think we can be just so incredibly proud of how we have led through this year. And really, it's been a leading through listening and listening to what our community members, um, family members, what our kids need, and listening to our staff members of. If these are the needs, then how can we move forward? And so being responsive and collaborative and casting a vision and saying, let's just go for it uh, because the need is there. So, so incredibly proud of the work. Um, certainly um, around the um, two options that we have for our fam two robust options we have for our families for next year. So absolutely the in-person learning, we've been doing that for a long, long time and are getting better at that. And then of course, I've had to manage things through safety lenses this year, but to have a full virtual academy uh, that is staffed and is considered a, 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 a separate school with a designated principal, designated um, commitment to that. And then also that you can see the district leadership team 
100% behind this. And so thank you board members for your vision and support as we've moved forward as a district. So as we look at this year and how we've handled things, uh, absolutely it's come at also some, some costs, um, certainly financial costs as well as emotional costs. And um, under the um, uh, federal government and state government, we have been given some reprieve uh, in a financial way um, along the way. So we had ESSER one funds that were allocated to us last summer um, and we were able to use that for some recovery costs um, that were due to the pandemic um, from the spring, as well as future costs, for example, PPE equipment that we've provided to all of our, our kids, our staff members, as well as what we've needed to um, teach social distancing in our spaces, um, as well as um, compensation for our employees um, due to the pandemic and where we needed time and a half for folks, uh, where we had our enterprise funds for both nutrition and and uh, daycare to keep those things going when we were shut down last spring. So there's been um, support um, to help our, our district recover from costs. And so in the spring, or well, I should say late winter, we got ESSER $2, which was not just recovery of costs, but it was future forward considerations for two major areas. One, safety precautions for in-person continued learning and preventing the spread of virus and two, to recover learning costs and or re recover learning that's been lost and what the cost of that might be. So whether that be summer school programming or wraparound services throughout the school year, and even we always say we got to start with the core instruction and that's where we know um, is the greatest target. So what are our teachers and our staff members and our principals need to lead core instruction to recover learning as well? Most recently, uh, just uh, now, not even um, 10 days ago, we have now been issued under the America Relief Act what are ESSER $3 um, allocations. And so that's what the slide is in front of you. This is another um, round of allocations so that we can continue the efforts. We know it's not going to be um, August of 2021 where all of a sudden we've recovered all learning and all social emotional impact and trauma, certainly trauma in our community, not just from the pandemic, but also from the derecho that our families have experienced. And so we know it's, it's going to be long-term where we need to address um, recovery of learning and then also the mitigation efforts that will be needed as we continue to manage the pandemic as we move forward. So these ESSER three allocations that have been recently, um, dis uh, haven't been distributed, but have been communicated what each district will get in the state of Iowa are still for those two major areas. There is a little bit of a difference though. I am gonna emphasize area number two here, the recovery of learning lost um, at least 20% of the allocation of the ESSER $3 have to go towards recovery of learning lost. And in our district, uh, we are receiving a greater amount than perhaps some of our neighbors because the allocations are determined based on Title I funding, and we um, qualify for quite a bit of Title I funding. Um, funding in our district. So that number two of recovery of learning lost, 20% um, of our allocation ESSER $3 um, dollars, is um, um, a, a, a certainly a significant amount of money. The total amount of money for ESSER 3 for our district is just over $32 million. And so 20% of that, certainly a generous amount, but we know uh, based on our strategic plan and especially our focus on equity, you know what the assessment uh, review was from our last board meeting, we're, we're going to need greater than 20% to do what we need to do for all of our children. So that will be the future forward work. Some of the possible expenditures that can fit under these two major areas are listed on the screen here in front of you. Um, I will say there is another slight difference with the ESSER three allocations that they can be used for supplanting, um, not just supplementing um, expenditures. 
So if we had costs that were incurred over this past year, we can um, recover some of those costs through some supplanting efforts, um, whether that be positions or um, uh, resources that we've had to use. Um, certainly that, that can be a consideration. However, if we are talking about compensation, for work in relationship to recovery of learning loss, it has been emphasized that has to be clearly articulated for future forward work. So as we make our recovery of learning loss plans, uh, when we think about compensating employees for summer, summer work, as well as um, before and after school programming, perhaps for prof professional development, curriculum development work, um, that would be work as we move forward that we would be able to compensate employees. So um, facilities can be considered in this allocation, especially in regards to air quality and HVAC. That is going to be um, an allocation that we would like to consider um, for our school district. So um, it is definitely opportunity. We take this very seriously. And we'd also like to think about our belief statements on our, that, uh, our six major belief statements as a school district student learning, equity, and absolutely how can we get innovative with this work so that we are really lifting not just what has happened over the past year, but accelerating what we want for all of our kids and what we've wanted all along. So um, that's all I have for you on ESSER 3 allocations. And we know board members that you probably want to ask some questions. So why don't we do this? I'm gonna put the ESSER allocation funds to the side for a minute. And why don't we start with our um, Office of Learning and Leadership team, questions you have about learning processes and CRBA for next year, and then we can jump into the ESSER um, three allocation um, questions as well. So would open up to board members um, in regards to um, learning options for next year. Uh, I have a question with the CRVA. If students decide to start out that way and then want to change their mind and go in person, is, is that an option? Or if once they've signed up, they stay in it and they can't switch that option? A great question, President Humbles, and we've had a lot of discussion about this and decided that we're really asking families, they've, they've been able to try options this year. But mm -hmm. when we shift students in and out, there's disruptions for students, families, and for staff. So we've asked people to pick the option and then to stick with that. With that said, just like in any other year, if there is some type of emergency or a student isn't being able to be successful, we will, of course, be flexible. But we're asking them to stay in the environment so we can plan accordingly and there's not those disruptions, again, for students, for, for families, and for staff. Thank you. I have a couple questions about CRVA. Um, first, do we have any uh, preliminary numbers from kids? Um, and related to that, how many teachers, like how many full-time equivalencies would that be? Um, do we have do we have any numbers that you could share? So we can share the data. We thought you'd ask this question as well. So we can share the data from the survey results. So I'm going to read what we have. So we have 98 students that have signed up K-5 for CRVA for next year. We have 76 sixth through eighth grade students. And then we have 167 ninth through 12th grade students that are picking those main remote options, that one and two. So that's a total of 341 students. With that said, there's another 121 high school students that have picked that third option. So the combination of potentially all. So maybe I'm going to go and in, um, attend in person, but there's a class where I'm going to do remote with a CRA teacher, like with one of our teachers. And maybe there's another class that's only offered through Ingenuity. So I can take a mixture of all those three. We'll really have to dig into that and find out more information from those students of what that looks like. So we're really basing our staffing on that total of that 341. And we started these initial conversations this afternoon. So full transparency, right? Because we didn't know how many students. So as of right now, we've, we've joined and do, done some combination classes where we plan on posting four full-time positions on Monday for elementary. 
but for middle school and high school, it looks very different um, just based on the needs. So with 76 middle school students, most staff, of course, have more than that on their current roster. They have 120 to 150. But we need to have different content areas, right, of math and science and social studies um, and ELA. So with those four, what we're going to plan on doing is seeing, well, we have two different options. So how we've left it at this point is looking at having people maybe that are in person that have a slot or an opening where they could teach a remote class in addition to, and having then a sixth grade ELA teacher, you know, teach a class and a seventh grade ELA teacher an eighth grade one. This is where it gets tricky. We also have looked at the option of having a couple full-time, but then it looks, you don't have a giant roster, right? But you have a lot of content. So we've looked at the option of being a science and math teacher and what that would look like and then having an English and um, social studies teacher, but you'd have sixth through eighth grade, which isn't the typical way to look at it, right? And you'd have two content areas versus one. So we didn't know if that's very feasible. So we've been leaning towards, and again, this just started full transparency conversations today but we'll staff it one of those two ways. So there may not be full jobs posted. And we of course would work on communication with staff on what that looks like. And then at high school, due to the accreditation and all the credits and certifications needed by staff, it would definitely have to follow the model of students sign up for certain classes with teachers, but they will most likely be in-person teachers in addition to picking up maybe a period, maybe two periods, of that remote instruction, depending on their current course loads of what students have signed up for. And the various buildings would look very different, but their schedules will align. So we'll be able to figure that out. So I know that's a lot from, like I said, multiple hours of conversation, but hopefully you get an understanding of what that staffing piece could look like. And then as you know, we have a principal and we've hired an engagement specialist and we still have to talk about counseling supports and secretary supports and all of those pieces for this school, but we're working through that plan currently. Uh, just uh, thank you. That's that's good information to know. I appreciate that. To follow up on, on uh, teachers, perhaps at the middle or high school level who might be teaching in-person classes as well as the virtual academy, um, do you see those class preparations as being the same? Um, is that going to be like another prep for the teacher? How, how do you envision that? And maybe, maybe we're early in the game and we don't know yet. We are early in the game. I will say that the prep, which is why we talked about like a virtual hub this summer for the teachers that are doing this. And then again, based on the feedback of those 50 Cedar Rapids teachers that they gave us, we have the, the foundation, right? We have the unit plans, but as you all know and have heard, doing it remotely does look a little bit different. So at the high school with block scheduling, they do have expanded, all of the teachers will have expanded planning time because they'll have that 90 minute block. With that said, there'll be additional expectations of PLC time in place and so forth. But I definitely think as we're planning and considering this, the teachers are going to need some time to plan what that remote instruction will look like. And hopefully we have a lot of that work done on the front end this summer. So they feel really good about the unit plan creations and they can roll it out. In addition to all the work that the teachers have done this year and all the collection of the data in their various Google classrooms and so forth that they've been collecting as they've been teaching remotely phenomenal what they've created and put together. So we'll be able to utilize a lot of that. It's just about getting it organized and available for people and then having them have an opportunity to look through everything. Okay. I, I'm really sensitive to teacher time, as you can imagine. Um, and I, I know that our teachers have gone way above and beyond the last um, school year. So if teachers are interested in doing the virtual academy, um, will they be, will they know what the summer obligations are when they throw their name in the hat? Will that be made clear to them? 
we've discussed that that would be very important to not only have what the summer obligations are, but the actual dates in place so they would know when they would be expected or have the opportunity at least to be able to come and get some of that virtual learning in place. And I don't think it would be required, but I think most of them, of course, would want that if they would be available. But we're definitely going to communicate that on the front end so they're, they're aware of what this exactly looks like and what the responsibilities would be. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all those for all those answers. I have just a few questions. Thank you, Director Garlock, for asking those questions. I have just a few questions that I'd kind of like to build on top of that, that um, some of them were answered, but some of them not, not quite. So when you were saying that we're looking at 98 elementary students that are currently um, for enrollment for elementary and four teachers, that's a class size of almost 25. It's approximately 25. Are we reaching um, in elementary to have those class sizes be at that, that preferred level, that 21 for K-1, 23 for second and third, and, and 25 for uh, fourth and fifth, or is it just kind of 25 across the board? The preferred levels of our course, what we're looking for, there's also, um, so I'm just going to throw out right now, there's two kindergarten students, right? So that's going to be, we've got to communicate with those parents. It's not going to be a good fit for two kindergarten students. It doesn't mean that some more won't quickly call and sign up where we couldn't have a kindergarten class, but I think that's communication on our end. But for example, for first and second, if we're placing them together to have that multiple grade, which I as you know, that happens a lot here. I think that's challenging and difficult, but I think as long as teachers know that on the front end, we're trying to meet those metrics while still allowing students to sign up and be in that. And that doesn't mean like right now today at this point of time, it was that four, but I think we have to closely watch that because there is one of those sections is on the bubble um, of where we would want it to be and potentially have to look to add later because there will be new students, I'm sure moving into Cedar Rapids, that maybe we'll pick this option as well, even though we aren't allowing those shifts in environments. But really appreciate that point and definitely think it's important to watch those metrics of class sizes. Thank you. And then one more thing about staffing that occurred to me, the specialized professional learning that um, is kind of scheduled for this summer uh, for those teachers that are opting to apply for that CRVA option. I'm wondering if any of those classes could be used towards um, continuing education hours or credits, or if they're um, falling in line with teacher leadership, or, or if there's some other opportunities there. can answer that. We are the only district in the state of Iowa that allows for those continuing ed opportunities with certifications. And so, and actually Ryan Reedstrom is the expert in that area. So Ryan, I'm going to hand that over to you. Yeah, I, I, um, it would just have to go through the charter committee. One thing that we would have to think about um, is if that teacher would like to apply it to lane change credit, we were going to compensate the teachers. So you can't, uh, I believe you can't be compensated and take the class for credit for lane change. It's either or, um, but some teachers may say, hey, I'd rather take this uh, for lane change credit and not get paid because on the long term, it will be better for me. So I think that is a viable option. We just have to go through the um, approval process through TQ um, and then our team together. But yeah, we could definitely do that because we'd have, we'd have more than 15 hours and we just would need 15 hours of seat time for it to be one credit. Awesome, thank you. And thank you for considering that. I do have other questions, but I'm sure the board members do too. So I'm gonna step back for now. Thank you. Quickly check to see if anybody else unmuted first. I am um, curious, so you mentioned, you know, this so is the 98 breakdown for K through five and then I hear two people for kindergarten. One of the thing I one of the things I picked up is that ingenuity is not an option for K five, which means the synchronous is not an option. I think that was basically what I what I thought I heard was that because of the level of scaffolding, is that the only reason, or was there cost and some other reasons? So with ingenuity, it's just really hard because it's a self paced instruction and curriculum where you're not necessarily having to check in or work directly with a teacher. So for our young learners, that's really challenging when they're learning to read and learning basic math, math facts and so forth. So 
We didn't believe it was the best instructional model, which is why also, and I think Craig alluded to this, we aren't even recommending that necessarily for middle school students, mm -hmm. but we wanted it as an option just because for a few of them, they have been in that environment and chosen that aspect this year and it's worked well for them. But we're believing that anytime that we can directly link our curriculum with our instructors and our teachers to do it, you're going to have better benefits for students for sure. Yeah, good. I appreciate that clarification. Um, the And I also want to be clear on the three options for high school. The one that is not going to go on, like what is hybrid now, which is a kid can choose to go in like today I decide I'm going to stay home. Tomorrow I decide I'm going to go in. So you can have virtual classes. You can have in-person classes, but you can't have one class be both things. Right. 100% correct. Yeah. Great point to make. Thank you. Thank goodness. That's all I have to say. Thank goodness. Yay. <laughs> uh, so, many, so many options. And uh, certainly this year, it's been a blessing uh, to have that flexibility. But I think seeing those three options uh, still in existence uh, is great. So appreciate that. That's, all, that's really all I've got for right now. Thank you. We try to stay away from that term hybrid mm -hmm. to eliminate the confusion there. Yeah. And, and to be and to be very clear, it's if a teacher is teaching three sections of in-person ELA nine and two sections of CRVA ELA nine, that CRVA won't have any students in front of them in person. It's completely virtual. Um, yes. So it, the teachers have a very distinct presence. So it's not like, hey, I'm signing up for a CRVA ELA nine, and we're, Kennedy, we're also going to put three kids in there in person too. So it's very distinct, your CRVA or your in person and the teacher won't have the two, two settings happening at the same time. Yeah. Much appreciated, I'm sure for, for teachers and, and everyone else. So thank you. Hey, I have a question. Um, when we see um, Clayton Ridge School District on the, on the denial um, report, that is, that's their version of CR, or, VA, right? So um, will, do we reach out to people like that and just explain, I mean, are we doing that already? I assume we will next year. And, and as education progresses, like people will just know that we have this option. But, um, and in that case, do we also just flat out, it's like, basically, we're saying no. So we are reaching out to them. So if they fill out open enrollment paperwork, for that, we're reaching out and saying, hey, did you know we have a virtual program that looks like this and you can sign up your students? And most of them, of course, are unaware and are like, perfect, we're going to stay then in the district. But if it's still before that March 1st deadline and people want to exit for whatever reason, you know, we would need to accept that. But that hasn't, okay. I mean, they've all, they've shifted to our program. Great. Can you um, talk to us a little bit about your plans for assessing uh, the students that are in this particular program? Um, is it the same? Is it different? How are you going to compare? Just curious. So well, I've talked a lot and Ryan, I think you, you'll want to, your experience this year is going to be helpful in answering this anyway. Yeah. So um, this year, all of our remote students still took our uh, benchmarks. So um, our map and WEA, um, our iReady as well as our FAST assessment. Um, so they'd continue with those benchmarks and um, Superintendent Bush talked about ISASP. Um, remote or like the formative assessment um, will look different. And that's some of the stuff that really in our design principles that we really thought about. Um, um, talked about open walled, personalized, company based ed, and that's really what we're shooting for. We might not get out um, of the gate that way right next year, but how do we provide students for, for, um, for, for, for how do we provide students performance tasks that they can really show what they know, understand, and have um, a voice and choice in that? So. Um, we will still give the unit assessments. Um, that's something that we felt um, is important so that we can compare and contrast our student demographics um, with um, in person. And um, also we have created, um, started to create a student support rubric that talks about four different areas with our eight different areas, academics, SEL, behavior, connection, um, 
and connectivity to name a few. So that's some of the intake surveys that we'll be taking with families to provide what type of support. So we will, Ernie has already talked a lot about how he wants that MTSS to look like in the virtual environment, because that is one thing we really need to learn and grow in throughout this year is how do we get the students we know so that we can intervene um, and extend at the right time. Just to insert a little bit, MTSS is the multi-tiered systems of support. And there are, we really have a comprehensive three-tiered system. Tier one is core instruction. Tier two is plus more of core instruction. And tier three is really targeted, targeted intervention work. So just that's what um, the universal conversation is across our state. They use the multi-tiered system of support language. I know we can get acronym -y sometimes and just wanted to make sure that all of our board members knew what MTSS was. And one thing that um, Angela Billman and Mark Conwell have been prototyping is our use of Tableau that we can um, see early intervention signs for those students as our teachers collaborate so that we and we can break it by, down by demographic grade level teacher on on target not on target so that we can use action data in an efficient way and i think that will be very um, instrumental in our work with crva students and the whole district actually so. and, and have you had started to have conversations about uh, when you are presenting assessment data to the public, to this board, other areas, how you will or how you will not uh, differentiate this particular population with your traditional population, because I know you want to assess things to read how they are, but you also want to make sure that you're maintaining confidentiality because it is such a small population. So just if you if you thought about that or um, if, you, if you could address that a little bit. Yeah, typically we wouldn't give out um, any, uh, any any information if the end's below 30. That's the state guideline on that. So we, we wouldn't share data along those lines. And, and our groups aren't quite that small. They're pretty small. And to be, to be crystal clear about this, CRVA is the 32nd Cedar Rapids School. So it's going to come up on all of our report cards uh, and adequate yearly progress reports as the 32nd attendance center in Cedar Rapids. So it'll be its own thing. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, th I think that's how you'll be able to bust it out. We're, we're really interested in making sure that, that uh, you know, amongst a lot of things that, 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 that our kids there aren't somehow uh, slipping and not getting things that they would get in a, in a traditional experience. Plus, we'd like to think we can add some value at the same time that may not show on traditional assessments. So. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I just wanted to uh, clear up, uh, will our virtual students still be able to come into um, buildings and get grab and go lunches next year? Yes, they'll, yeah. still, they'll still have food service options and be able to grab those within buildings. And as well as all of our extracurricular activities and things. So one thing we do want to uh, publicize and really we're kind of we're really pushing on this, especially for our, our K-5 learners, is we know how much how important it is for that social social um, social connection. So there are going to be opportunities for in-person events um, if CDC guidelines allow for that and if parents feel comfortable doing that. Um, but we did want to put that in there as we progress because we want this to be sustainable over years that if they're um, for our littles, say for first graders, and we want to go do a read aloud at the library so that they can have some social interaction and we'll do a read aloud at the public library and check out books and then do this type of stuff. That Those will all be opportunities for our students or go to um, Jones Park for a science experiment. Um, so those are the things that we are looking forward to in the future. And the really nice thing is Madison has four classrooms that are open. So we'd be able to put those four teachers within the building to get that additional support. And then when students are scheduled to come in, they of course have the principal, they have the teacher engagement specialist and all the sports that the in-person learners would have as well. And then the other question I had was, are we providing hotspots if kids need them? And have we thought of, will we have, you know, like a in-person internet hub option or is that something that we could look at that could you know, potentially be beneficial, not just for our virtual learners, but, you know, as an after school space for just regular high school students who might be just taking one class online or just to catch up on 
more capture time. I don't know if the population of virtual students, I assume they're spread throughout the entire district and aren't you know, concentrated in any one area, but if there were like a centralized area, I could see that working out, but are we doing anything like that? So for the uh, the next couple of years, uh, at least for the next year, uh, I'm hoping that we can uh, continue with uh, the same level of of support with the hotspots that that we currently had for all of our kids who would need it. Um, and so we're we're going to aim for that target. Um, we'll see how close we can get. We've got a couple of uh, really great sustainable grants going right now uh, along those fronts. Uh, we're members of the T-Mobile 10 million project which uh, that'll put out by next fall, over 2000 hotspots available for CRCSD kids. And we were also just uh, were awarded this spring uh, a Verizon grant that gets every kid who needs it at uh, both uh, Wilson Middle School and uh, uh, Metro a hotspot. So we're making inroads there and we're, and we're gonna continue to keep up partnerships with uh, uh, IMON, you know, local provider, we provided, uh, they provided through a CARES Act grant, uh, just over 350 uh, um, connections to households. So it's actually getting everybody in the family access to Wi-Fi. So, you know, I, I hope between that, that footprint, we're going to, we're going to continue to, to, to address equity at home, you know, along with giving the devices out and making sure the devices stay out in the field. Um, you know, again, we are we are collecting devices over the summer, except in really rare cases where, um, you know, at the end of a uh, child's 12th grade year, we'll collect them. And in a typical school year, we'll probably would do some collections the year before we refresh in in uh, in uh, uh, in eighth grade. But short of that, we're trying really hard to, to keep as much uh, of our hardware out in the field as we can. So hopefully that helped. Ernie, you had stated that for for the CRVA that you'll engage families. How will you go about engaging the the families? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, as was mentioned, Madison will be the physical home of um, CRVA and the, the elementary teachers. And as you know, President Humbles, we have a great campus uh, right there in that little neighborhood. So I would foresee hopefully some in person meetings if we're we can do that safely under whatever guidelines. Um, we have in August, but, you know, to, to the Wi-Fi question, um, one part of this year that's been amazing is the amount of connectivity we have spread across the community um, as part of our, our district work. And we just completed conferences, um, conversation number five in our family engagement work. And families now are just routinely talking with teachers through Google Meet using the Chromebooks and the Wi-Fi um, connections that we have provided. So I see a lot of using those platforms that families are now comfortable with and very uh, fluent with um, in person. I think a combination of those, those tools will be ways we reach out and we'll engage teachers in uh, that outreach as we get to know the kids that they'll be serving. Any other questions at all? Uh, yeah, I do just have a few more and kind of building on what you were asking, President Humbles, I'm wondering if that that family engagement strategic plan is going to be kind of followed so that we will have some consistent data to look at to see if that's effective um, in a remote setting as opposed to in person and, and kind of just make some um, some shared practice moving forward based on that data. We're definitely going to stick with our family engagement initiative and getting some additional feedback currently from staff and have a, a group that's been working on what does that look like for next year. In addition to that, of course, we have the SIAC. We have SIAC committee tomorrow night, actually, where people will be providing additional feedback on what family engagement can look like for next year. So we definitely will embed that into our CRVA as well and have that as a focus area because we think it's critically important whether you're remote or in person for all of our students and families. Awesome. I love to see that lessons learned were applied for, to, for moving forward. And also, you know, that delivers the CR, the CRVA is delivering on the uh, strategic plan um, systems and resources. And then that the family engagement also be under that focus of culture. Um, my last question that I have about CRVA is about 
how does it interact with Iowa Big? I just want to make sure that that I think that's such an awesome opportunity um, for our high school students, and I'm I'm just wondering if they'll still have that opportunity when they are a CRBA student. So I would love to be able to take this one, if that's okay, <laughs> Deputy Superintendent Quaker, is that right? And I think Cynthia Phillips is on the line here as well. We've actually had this conversation um, uh, all along, and uh, Dr. Trace Pickering, who is our Executive Director of Iowa Big, has the timeline that you saw that was shared for around um, what to do with CRVA, Dr. Pickering has been one of our key leaders in those conversations. And so he has been threaded into this all along and looking at, um, even from an Iowa big point of view, there's currently students who maybe have scheduling barriers. And so how can we even look at those three options within the high school point of view of how we continue to grow? Also, when we look at CRVA, and I just want to reemphasize what, what Craig Barnum um, highlighted here, it is our 32nd school. So everything we do as an entire district applies to the virtual academy as well. And it is a, an official attendance center. So with that, um, when we look at the bigger umbrella of our strategic plan, CRVA applies, not separately, in, in just in isolation. It's everything that we do. So our innovative work and how we're connecting all the lenses here, I think it'll continue to provide flexibility and access and remove some barriers actually for our high school students who are looking to put their feet in many different opportunities we have for them. So um, so thank you for asking that question. So he's he's been a part of that and giving us great feedback. That is great to hear. Thank you so much. So I would just ask if the um, uh, board of directors have any other questions in regards to CRVA or even in-person learning uh, for next year. And certainly we can um, continue to ask those questions before we shift to any specific questions you have around ESSER three funds um, as well. So uh, just for the team, uh, any additional questions about next year's learning design? The only, I do have one question. It's like a really big, broad question, but I, I think it's been, I think this year the administration's done a great job of kind of um, not only providing a structure for, for instructional delivery methods, but also keeping track of what's working and what isn't working for both staff and families. So I'm wondering what lessons learned are going to be carried forward. It sounds like family engagement is going to be a part of that. Um, I'm wondering what other lessons learned given our unique circumstances this year are going to become part of what we'll be pursuing next year. So I think part of that with CRVA is those in-person check-ins that we're having in place to make sure students are still connected and have those social interactions with that social emotional learning. Um, I think there's a lot of additional ones like you could get feedback from teachers, right? That the small group, small group work is, is making a difference and they can form connections with students that way. I think the innovative practices and links to the community and those community partnerships, there's been a lot of community partner meetings lately and everybody wants to step up and help out, which is so great. And all of those opportunities. So how can we not only engage families, but community partners and making sure that our students can be successful and finding that, that right link, whether it's, you know, Iowa Big or CRVA or that in-person learning and instruction. So whatever it is, but just really paying attention, listening to, I think, also family feedback um, on what's best for their kids and the options that we've presented, I know have been challenging at times because there's been lots of disruptions and shifting. But I also think we've learned from that and families have learned from that and we'll be able to pick the best option for their students moving forward based on the experiences and opportunities for, for some of our students. There are definitely things that we know um, we don't wanna have to do again <laughs> uh, that have been painful you know, for, for everyone um, in regards to um, um, like having to shift everything within a day uh, to um, um, go to remote learning because of the, you know, county percentage rate is so high. Our hope is that, you know, as people continue to be vaccinated, that this becomes less of a concern. But if you're watching the international news, we can't say that it's 
going to be removed. So I think our lessons learned are the more we can equip um, um, our whole system to be responsive and keep focused on the bigger picture um, that uh, our kids have been really resilient through this, but it's been through the adults staying calm. It's going to be okay. We can do this together. Um, that, um, that, that might sound really vague, but I think that that's been our philosophy as a school district. We're not going to panic. It's going to be all right. And we will get there, you know, and so look at here where we are here on April 24th, um, which is not the conversations we were having in late October and early November when, you know, our, the surgence of the pandemic was rising. So I think those are some key lessons that we have learned in listening, 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 and reassuring everyone and proactively communicating. Here's plan A, here's plan B, and we still need flexibility. <laughs> so I think those are big, big lessons learned. But again, reiterating what um, Deputy Superintendent Quaker has said, our community partners and, and families have been just so forthcoming with us and just finding out what, how can we get better. And our staff, who's been so willing to say, have you thought about, reconsider this, and having those, um, we've had these um, kind of quarterly conversations, specifically actually with our teacher leaders in CREA leadership. We got another one that we're looking at next week, principals, district admins, CREA leadership about, okay, lessons learned. What are some other things that we need to consider? So continually, intentionally having those conversations proactively. Thank you. So if um, certainly we would welcome any, if anything else pops up, but maybe we can shift the conversation. Um, um, uh, President Humbles and, and Board of Directors, any questions that you have around the S or three allocations? Um, and I don't expect you to know all the rules and regulations. That's certainly our job to manage that, but definitely would love to um, invite conversation and questions. Um, as we uh, move some, something forward. And just so you know, there have been question, or internal conversations about how we um, design and support um, recovery of learning and also how we keep everybody safe. And I, and I think that was my question too, the uh, learning recovery uh, through uh, the ESSER and um, just how we move forward. So it was helpful that you gave us the overview, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Esther one, the two, and the three, because we do have a loss of learning in that you guys are aware of that and know that there's work to be done. So I appreciate that. I do have a question. I'm assuming that when we're working with outside partners, if we're working with outside partners, first, I, I anticipate we're going to be reaching internally first um, for, for staff members to be leading in that learning loss if it's through a summer program or before after school program. Um, however, if we are partnering outside of district, I'm assuming we're going to be using an RFP process, um, which has become part of our norm for, for forming partnerships. I'm just hoping that um, there's some being some thought given to scalability of, of any kind of partnerships that we may pursue. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. One is that, you know, we always want to um, decrease the achievement and opportunity gap. And, and the other is I think that, I don't think that learning loss is gonna be recovered in over a summer. Or, or over a year. And, and I think that, you know, if, if we have a strong framework in place there, um, I, I think it would be something that would be um, valuable to share with other districts as well. So just wondering if any thoughts been given to scalability. So because of the board gave very clear direction a couple of years ago about clarifying our current RFP process that we use with, with our, our um, community partners, focused on results. 
great to have amazing positive relationships that we know can make a difference. But what's the evidence of those the, of the difference that's being made? I'll just use at-risk dollars as an example, dropout prevention dollars, which certainly we can use, for example, around mental health supports and preventative measures and, and even responsive me measures as we talk about that multi-tiered system of support. Many times these are tiered, tier two and tier three interventions that we're putting in place to support our kids. So having those results. So what we have now, um, because of the data has gotten so much clearer for us in our processes, we have evidence of processes that have been working and producing results. So we would like to make sure that we're capitalizing on that through that RFP process. Of, um, certainly, uh, so as you know, we have amazing school counselors, but our school counselors are not necessarily th certified therapists. And so we RFP and go through community partnerships in order to provide targeted work around mental health efforts if needed for our children. So that's one area that we know if we need to scale, how can we scale that? And what does that look like? And a reminder that we also only get these dollars for two years. So we can recover a, quite a bit, but we also need to look at what's sustainable over time and how can we maximize this opportunity to make sure that we are equipping our district for sustainability post that two year time as well. So great question. And yes, there will be an RFP process for our partners. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a few things, but to start with, I forget which meeting it was at, but when we were talking about ESER two funds, there was uh, talk about some of those funds being allocated for summer programs. Um, is that what we were still planning to do? Uh, what type of programs are we looking at? Are they things that could be expanded even further with ESSER three funds? But what are we looking at right now with those summer programs? We just actually met again on that today. So we're trying to really look at what's worked in our system and pr has proved those results for students and those outcomes. So we are expanding KCU, or as the plan is to expand that, not just at the elementary, but go into the middle school. We had it at two buildings, but we're hoping to have that at more buildings as well. We're also working on this community partnerships and really having a targeted outcome of what we need around reading and math outcomes for students and have been working on an RFP process for what that can look like. And then Nicole. credit recovery. Um, and is what? Can you say what Casey Kids is? on Course University. Thank you. And then also credit recovery at the high school. We've always offered that, right? But this year is a little different because we have more students that have those gaps. So offering instead of just this ingenuity where students can make up those credits, in addition to that, having some in-person teachers be at all of the high school buildings, have students sign up and really have that added extra support to try to get those students to be able to close those gaps and recover as many credits as possible is one of our focus areas. In addition to the recovery of learning and the acceleration of learning for, for all of our students at elementary and middle school. So we're, we're working on finalizing the details. We also have some opportunities we're looking at for staff. One of them I talked about, about the virtual hub but we can send you that, that list. We're meeting one more time this week as a group because we want to have that finalized so we can post positions and get those staffed for the summer here this next week. We also have some opportunities for our special education students to embed in the programs I talked about, but also level two and level three programming that is explicitly for those students and what their needs are and getting the staff in to support their learning and those social skill development as well. So can later on this week, share that whole list. Um, I'll, I can send that to Superintendent Bush, who, who will have that anyway, but, and then she can get that to the board. But the plan is to have those all in place again before next week, so we can start posting those staff positions early next week and letting you see what those opportunities are. We focused on summer, again, just really expanding what, what works for us. And then the plan is to get more voices at the table to look at what that learning loss and the recovery can mean for the future and what some tutoring, peer tutoring can look like, even adult to student tutoring. So lots of different ideas for future, but really right now we're focused on that summer piece and getting that in place. 
In addition, we had some very innovative ideas from our superintendent student advisory council that deputy superintendent and I meet with. Um, and we had a retreat with them on April 15th. And they have some thoughts around a boot camp to prepare our high school students for peer to peer tutoring um, programs, as well as um, mentoring younger students, all through a pronouncement and a lens of equity and access incredible young leaders we have in our district. So we are looking at how we support that. Uh, that will need staff to help lead that boot camp work with our um, high school student leaders, uh, looking at an internship for them um, through the fall uh, that we could actually support them. And then here's the Here's, here's an innovative uh, thought. Once they do successful training, once they do successful internship, or they can go for volunteer hours if they so choose, um, they can, we can actually employ our students to be part of a clear support program, peer-to-peer -peer tutoring for after-school programming, and we can employ our kids to really build future ready paths, not just for them, but the, their peers who they're supporting. So there's a big innovative um, thought for you and for another use that we'll use for summer programming. That partially uh, answers my question was, you know, are we doing anything to not make this feel like summer school to the kids that, you know, really um, struggled through the last year and really need to recover that learning? Um, it sounds like we are. I'm really, I'm really excited about everything um, that you said. And um, I, I am glad we're thinking innovatively about it. I just, I don't want kids to feel punished, you know, for having survived this last year <laughs> or teachers for that matter. We've had some initial conversations too about um, getting back to Director Borcherding's question about Iowa Big, et cetera. Some other innovative thoughts around the innovative practices for our high school students who perhaps even and big is it certainly can be accessible to freshmen and sophomores, but really it's been an invitation more for juniors and seniors. What sort of programming could we put in place with this opportunity for freshmen and sophomores that might be through maybe more of a magnet lens or attach or expanding virtual academy and Iowa big targeting really some freshmen and sophomores in an innovative way. Um, and that could be future forward um, structures as well. If we had a K-12 magnet program, we currently have K-8, we could, would also be eligible for um, the Magnet Schools of America grants as well. So I also wanted to ask as well, um, the ventilation upgrades, are we doing any of those with the previous ESSER funds or is that something that we're looking at for ESSER 3 funds? We've allocated that out of ESSER $2 and I'll hand that over to Dave Nicholson. Yeah, we're still uh, looking into this. We uh, there is a um, was a bid that was done out of Texas, and this bid uh, was for the bipolar ionization equipment that we were looking at doing at our buildings that will help uh, with air quality, not only with uh, uh, viruses, it also should help with mold as well. And that's something where uh, we've been uh, visiting with our attorney to see if we could tap into that bid for the equipment piece of it and then look at potentially uh, bidding out the labor separate. And uh, so we're still having our attorney look at that because, uh, or if we have to uh, use the companies that was bid or the pricing that was bid together with that bid from Texas. So we're uh, 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 looking to see what is our cost, most cost effective way. If we could bid out the labor separately, that would be most, most cost effective, but we wanna make sure that we can legally do that on a bid that was previously bid in its entirety it had uh, parts and labor as a part component of it. We're wanting to know if we can just separate one piece of that uh, to save a little bit of money on the implementation side of it, but still meet the uh, uh, requirements where we would have to meet Davis-Bacon Act wages and all of that by doing that. So hopefully uh, we'll have an answer to that pretty soon, but that's our plan to move forward with that this summer. Um, but we're working out the details. Uh, once we get that worked out, then we would actually be bringing a recommendation to the board for approval with what our plan is, but working out whether or not we have to bid out separately or we could do it, just uh, uh, tap into the state bid. 
And one thing I wanted to further clarify, because ventilation upgrades, that's something that, you know, is a one-time cost, uh, more or less, besides, you know, ongoing uh, maintenance on a system like that. But um, for, I've been really pessimistic lately about COVID, like the superintendent was saying, when you look around the world and different variants. And so, and I had asked you this um, in an email, uh, superintendent, but just to clarify for me, are these... So when it comes to supplanting current funds, say we spent, took a million dollars of the current ESSER funding and put it towards allowable uses in our current budget, could we then set aside a million dollars, you know, to buy masks over the next 10 years if we think we're going to need them or to, I saw a study out of Omaha where they were doing a bigger uh, study of COVID in schools and they were testing wastewater at buildings and that's something I had seen at universities previously. Um, is that something that we could, you know, implement on a longer term basis if we're dealing with coronavirus, you know, basically every winter for the next foreseeable future? You know, I, I hate to say it, but like I said, that's the mindset I've been in uh, looking at the news lately. Are those, could we set up, use this money, set some aside and use this money over the long run to pay for those costs? Yeah, we would we would just need to. So knowing that this is a temporary lane for two years um, that we have for recovery of learning and, and to mitigate safety as much as we can with the current allocations, we absolutely can look at how are we um, looking at sustain sustainability. So even everything that we're discussing from a learning point of view, what are the structures we can make sure that are in place that are potentially sustainable structures? Um, and, and there might be allocations we have to make for temporary positions to heavy lift, but knowing we only have those for, for two years. So yes, for example, save dollars. Uh, we also have, we'll have another allocation of what are called gears dollars that, that can help us. Um, we, and there's management funds, there's all sorts of things. And then of course our general dollars. So yes, we can um, think about, I call them moving the coconut shells <laughs> in order to think about how we maintain this over time. And so um, know that, you know, the PPE equipment might may be with us for longer than we anticipated. And we want to be able to supply that um, to, to our kids and, and, and staff members. So yes, we will have to anticipate those costs um, and navigate this as the rest of the world is too. So I, and I do wonder about that too, Director Mershbrock of if this becomes a long-term thing that we have to manage, then I wonder what sort of federal dollar allocations will continue to come forward to help us all manage that. Um, Maybe, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Maybe this has been addressed and if so, I'll apologize, but I need you to refresh my memory. Um, it, it, an associated uh, situation caused by the pandemic is food insecurity. Um, can we use these ESSER funds for to provide meals through the summer for our students? So, and, and Dave can um, tell you the news from the USDA about um, next year. So Dave, why don't you address that? Yeah, they have extended this to go all the way through the next year. So I believe if we wanted to uh, uh, serve meals over the summer, we could through this program. Okay. And, and all students will be eligible for free lunch next year. Yeah. 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 I just, I, you know, I'm well aware that there are still families who are struggling, even though we're starting to come out of COVID, you know, parents who've been, who've lost their jobs and still haven't caught up uh, financially. I have a question about the, the structure of payments here. It's my understanding that the Department of Ed is managing allocation of funding of ESSER $3 per accomplishing objectives. My, my question is, one, is that correct? And, and two, if it is, are we having to submit a plan ahead of time um, like we did with the return to learn plan that had some qualifications and, and some schematics that had to be met. And then the Department of Education had the ability of saying, no, you need to do this differently. 
Um, or do we have some more flexibility um, in how we are, nobody knows our students better than we do. Nobody knows our teachers, our students better than our teachers do. Do we have flexibility to work within our own system to build a plan to best address learning loss and other items that would be paid for under ESSER dollars? So there's good news on this front. As, as difficult as the return to learn plan guidance was that needed to be submitted to the Department of Ed last year, July 1, and some of the rules that followed afterwards, um, uh, the, the news that we got from the Iowa Department of Education was the federal guidance that had been submitted or, or is uh, the language that you all have been able to take a look at and that we've been given guidance around. Because we went through that return to learn process, return to learn plan process, and we got feedback as a district from our community on that, we have met that guidance because there's so many other states who haven't opened up their schools at all. So really that language is applicable to the entire United States and we believe the state of Iowa has already met those requirements. So that's good news. Um, and secondly, in regards to meeting um, the Department of Education, this is a reimbursement process with SR3. So June 1st, the funds become available through reimbursement. So we will submit plans to the Department of Education just to ask, um, Dave about the additional account codes <laughs> that come with these opportunities. <laughs> and so it's really making sure that we're um, meeting those guidelines that it is. And so when Dave, uh, thank you so much to uh, his, his leadership and his department's leadership, really proactively asking our auditors a lot of questions and great guidance is coming from the Urban Education Network as well and the Department of Education webinars. We wanna be proactive so that we are not making a plan of spending money that won't be reimbursable to us. So that has, I think we've got a, a pretty good proactive plan already. Two thirds of the allocation will be available to us starting June 1st, as long as we have submitted um, reimbursable um, plans, then we will have another allocation come next, late next fall in November, the other third will come. So the proven results, we won't even have deliverables in regards to student learning yet. It's really that we are in alignment with how the funds are intended to be distributed. And we have to show that we are accountable to that. I will say D Director Lebo's most recent visit, she was very encouraging um, to, to our leadership team and actually encouraging us to get innovative with this work and address equity and do what we feel is going to be best as a school district. And I think that's become our reputation, quite frankly. Um, and um, the Department of Ed is looking for, for leaders like our district and many others who've just said, we're gonna get after this in the best way possible. So, um, that's what I have for you for right now. Noreen, can I add something to that? Um, there is some uh, prior approval you have to get for certain things with the grant. Like for example, if we wanted to buy equipment that costs more than $5,000, you have to get an individual piece of equipment that's cost more than $5,000. We have to get the DE's prior approval through the, uh, uh, the website they have set up for this. And also any construction type projects you have to, and the HVAC, type improvements would be one that we'd have to, prior to us moving forward, we have to get their approval to move forward on those. Uh, but uh, both like HVAC, we know that's gonna be improve, approved. It's just a matter of, we have to follow those steps when we're ready to go th that far. And the other component that um, the uh, SR3 or the American Recovery Act funds, those dollars, we cannot file for reimbursement until we spend that's all of SR2 first. And so we won't be able to tap into that until after SR2 is. So we might be, you know, uh, maybe some things that we were thinking maybe are SR3 dollar things. We might shift those to SR2 so we can get that money spent so we can get into the SR3 sooner. So, so it, it's reimbursable, but it's reimbursable for future action, for future work, or is no, it? It's for work that has been expended. So uh, cash flowing is you got to be able to cash flow some of this this work that you're doing um, uh, to be able to get reimbursed. So, for example, um, you know, if we're doing a significant amount of money, uh, 
in our, for HVAC, we'll be doing that work out of our PEPL, probably most likely funds. And then we'll have to immediately, as soon as that quarter, and you get it, you have to do it on a quarterly basis as a reimbursement. So you're filing for your reimbursements quarterly. And so cash flow can be, potentially could be an issue for some school districts with uh, what they're doing. So, cause it's reimbursement basis, not as the first round of ESSER funds, we got it all up front. Uh, but this, this, the second two are on a reimbursement basis. Is there anything in ESSER three funding or ESSER two funding that is designated towards staff reimbursement? As long as it was um, uh, due to the pandemic work. So if we needed to hire additional mental health support, then we can, in, say, for example, through contracted services, we can use that as an expenditure. So, yes. Thank you. This, this has probably sort of been addressed, but not directly. So I want to make sure that, um, well, maybe it's clear. We'll find out if I'm clear. Um, there are probably a, a good number of people who are maybe watching or not watching that are interested to know if this can be used for tax relief. It seems to me that I have heard quite a bit of conversation that uh, indirectly that it is it could not be. I was wondering if you could address that directly, please. Dave Nicholson will be glad to answer that question. Scott, are you talking about property tax relief? Yeah, I'm guessing that most people who are going to ask that question maybe aren't specific, but yes, I would think that tax relief may be one of the questions. Uh, again, I'm not necessarily advocating for that position, but I think it's a discussion that we should have. I think it would have to be in a, I don't know anything directly, but I think it would have to be if you are um, um, somehow uh, lowering a cash reserve levy or something of the district due to these funds that that might have an indirect, but I don't think there would be anything in a direct one-to-one -one saying we can actually uh, take these funds and we're going to buy down our our, our um, special ed deficit with these funds, 100 percent, so we don't have to levy that back and increase our taxes. I don't think there, that would be something that we would be able to manage to do. That's the only area that I think that might, you know, might and be a question. So, and there's no explicit. Um, um, uh, statement of whether it can or can't not. I think what Dave's highlighting is indirectly it may happen, but that would not be the targeted work for our district. We're going to be addressing those two major areas. How can we mitigate, keep things safe, and how do we recover learning? Um, and certainly if that impacted our special education work and how we're targeting special education work, it may have an indirect impact on staffing um, allocations with special education, but that... Um, not for for direct tax relief for our property taxes. Yeah, there are some things that we'll probably, you know, be uh, doing for a recovery of lost services that may have otherwise hit our special ed deficit. Thus, and we're using ESSER funds instead, thus it's lowering our deficit that otherwise would have been there, which in, 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 in effect could lower our, our levy just because of that in an indirect way. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, just going back to the summer uh, food program thing, I'm just looking at an article here. Um, it looks like, and this happened last, I think it was last summer, where uh, the federal government sent out SNAP, uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistant Program cards to a lot of the students, probably almost a majority of the students, I'd imagine, of, in our uh, district, uh, people who qualify for free and reduced lunch. And so it looks like they're extending that um, for this summer as well. And Dave, you were saying also that um, the ESSER funds could be spent so we could potentially do meals from the school buildings, but also families, it looks like, would be getting this uh, supplemental assistance as well. Um, at least that's what I'm reading is the most current action by the Biden administration. 
Um, yep, do we so we any? could, exactly, we can extend that summer program and then also next year free lunches and that added layer um, coming from the government. I don't know if there's anything that um, we can do or um, just make sure that everybody is uh, put in contact, knows that that's coming and to keep an eye out. It might be that they already have, I know my family got a card because we go to a elementary school that's the whole population is, you know, I don't know what the percentages are, but it's one of those schools. And so we got one of those cards and I don't know if it'll just be added to that or not, but just, um, I hope, you know, families are able to take advantage of that throughout the summer. Um, I also wanted to ask, and so you were talking about getting encouragement from the Department of Education about being innovative. Is there anything, any other big, pick, big ticket items? I, you know, I've got some that I'd like to talk about, but from you as superintendent, what are you talking about is, what's the big thing that we could do if you've got anything on your mind? So I, I, I um, yes. <laughs> so I'll just give you an example um, of, uh, we're, we're not solidified with this yet. So just, you know, we're, we're having some conversations specifically around, um, so when we look at our core instruction and, and supports for our kids every day when we have them with us, as well as our um, focus on equity, diversity, um, equity and inclusion, as well as supporting our staff and providing direct supports to our staff and growing our staff for opportunities. We're looking at um, some opportunities with some um, university partners of ways in which we can, I'm just gonna use a training example from our elementary right now. We have a training that's called the letters training and you've seen it on consent agendas several times. That is a targeted uh, literacy instruction that is proving results across our system that we are, we are supporting all of our um, early learner, early learning uh, certified staff to be um, certified with letters. Just imagine if we could also offer that for every elementary school um, paraeducator who's supporting targeted um, instruction or it through um, small group instruction or even individualized instruction, working directly with our special education staff and general education staff. So that started opening up some thought processes about what if we could look at ways in which we could partner with um, um, some of our post-secondary partners to tap on the shoulders of extending some invitations to paraeducators, for example, who may not have um, their initial um, four-year degree or a certification in teaching, but they're interested in doing that, but they haven't had the opportunity. So we're looking at somebody who specializes in adult education and um, how we might be able to partner with them in developing our paraeducators, targeting with what we need for our school district as an urban education school district with a pronouncement of diversity, equity, inclusion, and perhaps how do we continue to build those employees so that they can get their clinical experiences on targeted practices that we want to adopt at the same time looking at their certifications and ways in which we can help professionally develop them and even um, financially um, support them through a program like that. So certainly they might qualify for financial aid through the FAFSA opportunity, but for every particular course that they complete, could we offer some monetary gains on the salary schedule for them through professional development? And then building our own staff working in our district for those opportunities. So uh, we're looking at that for elementary education with reading endorsement and special education certifications. So that's one innovative thing we're thinking about of supporting staff and the staff member group that's saying, hey, I would like to be developed. So using what their current job is and maximizing a vision for themselves. So that's one, another innovative thing we've been talking about from staffing points of view. And similar with, with how we can continue to support our teachers with the professional learning community processes, them leading their learning, what do they need to target instruction for their kids, as well as summer um, opportunities. But I'll say this, if we could provide better structures to support our teachers um, through professional learning practices during the school year, um, whether that be long-term sub opportunities so that they can really get after some work together. If you give a group of teachers who are supporting the same group of students clear assessment processes and you give them some time 
and a system, they, what they can do in a day when you get out of their way is incredible. Those are the types of things that we would like to be able to put structures in place using these ESSER dollars to target how to support our employees. That sounds great. Um, I actually wanted to ask about paraeducators because, you know, in our personnel report today, we had, I think, nine resignations. I don't know why for paraeducators. And we heard a few meetings back about um, paraeducator pay. Is there any way that ESSER funds could be used, and maybe Dave could help with this, to make a significant improvement on base pay for paraeducators, you know, with the goal of help retain those people in the district, help attract new people in the district, help give those people security, you know, in their personal life with a higher wage, um, you know, that will then translate into the classroom, hopefully, but really supporting them as frontline in-classroom employees. And like I said, Dave, I don't know um, if you're able to kind of off the top of your head, do the numbers for what it would cost to, you know, bring paraeducators up to $15 an hour, um, but, I mean, that's something I know I would support, but, and I think it would have an impact, but I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, next, uh, not with temporary funds like this, that's, uh, you have to look at long range temper. And when you uh, do uh, recurring costs with wages like that, that is a, a long-term impact beyond the ESSER uh, funds period of time. So if you use ESSER, it would only be a short period of time and then that money would go away. And so that's, that's the issue with, um, I understand that, Dave. I just mean as a bridge, could if, is it something that if we thought it was appropriate, we thought it would make a difference now, could we do it now with an eye towards saying this is something we want to do long term, this is something we should support long term? How do we use this as a bridge to get to that point in the future, you know, knowing that it, it takes... I, I, I don't know how you do it. Uh, you can provide additional opportunities for them to do additional work to, to provide additional funding. They will have those opportunities with the ESSER funds, but just to say right out to increase uh, the wage itself, hourly wage, I don't think there is an avenue in ESSER that I'm aware of to do that, but I know providing additional work opportunities for those dollars, that would be an avenue to get to more funds. It's not intended for um, salary schedules, but what it is intended for is professional development, training, and, um, and, and then work, additional work. I think what we're thinking about is how can we professionally develop and grow that, 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 that um, particular employee group. But in regards to the concerns of the wage, we need to address that through a different strategy that's, that we can use long-term. And I hear, I think, we've definitely heard um, um, the concerns around that. And so I think that we continue to need to think about that from a different point of view of a strategy that's, that is sustainable over time, looking at our current structures, our current contracts, and then how might we be able to shift, especially those who are five years and fewer in the district in that particular employee group, how can we start moving them um, and, and and still sustain um, those with longevity, you know, within the district as well. I, at the top of that salary schedule, we have folks that are getting paid maybe $28, $29 an hour. And, um, and then others who are starting wages at um, 12, I said, Linda, I think 12 and a half, right around there. 12, 20. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Average, our average pair makes about $14 an hour, a little more than $14 an hour. Um, and, and what you're talking about uh, is really something that has to be negotiated. Whenever we talk about base wages, it has to go through the negotiation process. And so it has to be part of that strategy and part of the funding that we get from the state in regards to um, the base wage increase. So we wouldn't be able to do something outside of uh, that negotiation process. We are certainly looking at looking at professional development, para certifications, other ways in which we can support them and compensate them for that professional development work. And that's been uh, that's been an area in which they've had interest in for some time. And so this could be a great opportunity to uh, have a little bit 
of uh, use some of the funding for their professional development in the certification process, which is a huge, uh, many of our pairs used to get uh, the certification years ago. And so this would help us to bring up some of those individuals who are interested in continuing their learning and growth uh, through the certification process, which has an increase a lot uh, associated with it as well. Linda, just uh, how many paras who make under $15 an hour in the district do you think there are? Yeah, I, I don't want to guess, but I do have those numbers, so I can certainly send those to you. But it's, I can send you that. I can send you a little bit of an analysis so that you have a, a better idea of what the numbers look okay, like. I, we just had a slide today that said I think we have like 300 some paras in the district right now. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, getting them up with a $15 an hour would be a million dollars a year, maybe two. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something I think we should look at long term. And, you know, if there's any way to make it happen under these current, uh, with these current funds, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Big innovative things. This is, it's a simple thing, pay people more because they're worth it. But, um, you know, it's, it's a bold step that I don't know if uh, everybody else is doing. And if there was a way to do it, I definitely think we should uh, look into it. Um, I, th I think it is not allowable with these funds in the way in which you're describing it. We well, need about it from a different if, point of view. Just to keep on it, we talked about supplant and versus supplement earlier. If these funds were used to supplant other funds, I understand what Linda was saying about going through the negotiation process, but if these funds are able to pay for something we currently have budgeted, that frees up money, does it not, for something else? That's how I understand it. I don't know if I'm misunderstanding it. But I understand what you're saying. It's still only for two years and it's a lot of long term strategy, but I do hear you loud and clear. And I think that we can absolutely keep revisiting a, a longer term strategy for um, helping that particular employee group. Yeah. yeah and, I and I would say, um, you know, we, we too are supportive of a higher salary for our, our para group as well as, you know, other groups. Um, and we've done some cost analysis with our para group and it's a total compensation versus uh, hourly wage. We're very competitive, um, but, but people don't always see that um, in regards to the number of days that we have um, and, and some other different things that we have as benefits that most of our region does not have. And so it's it really is trying to figure out how we shift uh, the money that we get each year into their salaries. Um, and, and we certainly, we have uh, conversations about that every year. Um, and we are constantly trying to get creative on how we might be able to do that. Uh, I would like to say on behalf of the board, we want to thank you guys for uh, this presentation and the information and all of us being engaged in the meeting today. And we have a lot to be thankful for as we reflect on the current school year and much to look forward <clears throat> to with the coming school year. There's been a lot of great work. We've had some really great discussion tonight. Uh, very good questions from the board and I hope that you had your questions answered. So I thank all of you for participating um, in this questions. work session. I'm sorry, what I director? First I didn't know we were wrapping up so quickly. I had more questions. Um, what questions do you would you still like to ask Director Mershbroth? Well, just going back, you know, just so people know where I was coming from with paraeducator pay. If paraeducators are starting at 1250 and averaging 14, they can walk out of the district and go get a job where I work at the US Postal Service making $17, $18 an hour on day one. Um, and so whether or not we're competitive with other districts, you know, these people are dealing with our kids. And so that's just where I'm coming from, you know, from my point of view on that. Um, it's, it's obvious that uh, the work they do is very valuable. Um, I also wanted to ask um, about community schools and whether or not the superintendent thought expanding the community school program. First, you know, what are we seeing at Hoover Elementary where we have our pilot program for community schools? And could this money be used to expand that program? And again, if we're able to supplant some current funds, could we set up a community schools program, you know, pilot, expand it to five, 10 schools? 
that lasted for five years instead of just the two years by shifting some of those funds around and just what what the administration thought of that. So I think we're certainly learning through um, uh, the community school at, at Hoover. Uh, certainly we're learning through our magnet school programs as well. Really, that is a that is a long term strategy and takes the vision of a school that says, yes, I want in on this opportunity and a leader and a leadership that says that as well. Um, the results that have come from the community school um, effort would be glad to share with you Hoover's data. You could look at their their data. I would say that it's um, challenging to do a dot to dot connect on student achievement to this community school. But what we can connect is the uh, resources that are eligible to our families um, at the community schools. So I think those community partnerships, coming back to those community partners and leveraging um, those community partners from a scalable sense right now within that two year time period. But certainly if we had um, any of our schools that said we wanna do the community schools, we could absolutely um, look at our innovative funds that we've allocated for that and or a temporary time, um, the ESSER funds. But yep, that we, um, any single time a school says we want to get after something, we look at their school improvement plan and we can layer in. So that has been the success of that particular program because that school initiated it and wanted to lead it. And we have offered um, learning across our system around the community schools as well as our magnet schools. And so it really takes that school wanting to do that work. But we would support that if a school wanted to move forward with that work um, and do what we could to support the leadership to make that happen. I guess, Do you, uh, uh, hold on here. Oh, the only other thing I wanted to ask is um, about the internet hubs and, you know, not just for our virtual students, but would it make sense and would this help, not just with learning loss, but just learning in general to have more locations, not just at our school buildings, not everyone lives near a school building and not everyone at home has a place where they can sit, um, you know, have a quiet area where they can study and do learning. You know, they can go to the library, but not everyone lives near a library either. And you drive around town, there's many properties up for rent. Um, could we set up hubs like that, you know, over the next couple of years, knowing that students um, you know, are trying to catch back up and that we're trying to make progress. Is that something that uh, we could look at with these funds, kind of expand our footprint across the city, give more places for our kids to go, knowing that they all have devices um, and then we could set up a Wi-Fi at these places and then could this funding also be used to staff those places so there's help for our students, not necessarily during school hours. Craig, I'll hand that over to you. Sure. I mean, I think there's any number of ways we could we could tackle it. I mean, uh, you know, it's been a priority in our tech plan for for uh, since I've been here to to provide equitable access to internet both at home and at school. And as I said, I, I think we're we're closing in on that. Um, we've got some. Uh, I'll just restate: we've got some sustainable grants to get hotspots in kids' hands. Um, you know, in terms of partnering with communities and and uh, community partners, we're sure we're always open to that idea. Um, my my experience has been is that uh, kids typically, uh, you know, the beautiful thing about hotspots is they can take it wherever they go, um, so they're not tied to a location with that, and that's really why we've 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 strat we've put that strategy on there. So if they've got a spot in the neighborhood that's quiet uh, where they can do work, um, they can get there to do that with those devices, and that's really what we've been doing there. But again, you know, we we've had we've had uh, you know relationships with. The library and with uh, various community centers. And I wouldn't anticipate that we'll keep doing those things, but really, I think the end game for for us is trying to make sure that every kid's got a mobile device and access to the internet uh, in a in a space when they're not at school. And right now, that's that's hotspots. So, I appreciate um, it, Greg. Um, I just want to reiterate. I I think most kids can find a quiet spot, but not every neighborhood. Um, you know, has as many places and things like that. So I definitely think it's something to look at, you know, of driving up First Avenue today. I, I know our kids can hop on the bus and, 
you know, take the bus down First Avenue to the library or something, but there's, you know, a building on First and 40th on the Northeast side, and there's a row of apartments all up from probably 34th Street up north on uh, First Avenue and all the neighborhoods up there. And just, I'm just trying to bring it to where the kids, where they know they have a spot and, you know, like, I think you're right, the kids can find a spot, but the more options they have, especially someplace safe that they know is going to be there and that they know that they could get help. That's the type of thing that I think this money, it could make a difference kind of as an innovative thing if we're willing to support uh, a big step like that. So anyway. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for the presentation, for the information, for the questions that were asked. Um, and if you have additional ones, uh, feel, feel free to contact uh, Superintendent Bush or even Dave. Uh, great discussion. And with no further business, we stand adjourned. Everyone have a great evening.